Hi, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and I'm here with Catherine Austin Fitz. And we're at the Secret Space Program Conference, which is uh, up in San Mateo, California, and it's really in the belly of the beast as far as black projects and Secret Space Program go. Um, so this is a great honor to, to be it's talking a great to honor. you. I've been, I've been watching your videos for <laughs> years. <laughs> All right, well, well, thank you. So I guess it's mutual admiration society, as they say. Um, I, I want to say that, you know, we just did get a clip with you with C. Uh -huh. Bassett, and that's yeah. going to kind of predate this uh, on, the, on the interview. And it was great, some great um, authentic sort of Stories. live conversational, yeah. you know, anecdotal material. Uh, so what I want to do here is just back up a little bit. Uh, okay. I want you to give your background just for the people that may view sure. this and don't know about you and, and this will be their first exposure. And then I want to drill down into some things that you've been releasing lately. Okay. Um, we're kind of going to leapfrog over a lot of the sort of run-of-the-mill stuff and, and, and just jump around a bit because right. we, we're we probably in, on limited time here right. and I'm sure you're tired and you know it's been going on all day and uh -huh. you're kind of like it's great, though. It's very energizing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. all right. All right, yeah. cool. Well, you're kind of the center of attention at the moment uh, at the conference, I think. And I, I'm sure there's a reason for that because, uh, you know, it's very interesting to be part of the sector as I have for over eight years. And uh, what happens with people is that they come onto the scene, and especially if you have a background in sort of what we call the mainstream, uh -huh. and you are a renegade from the mainstream, and you've been pushed out of the game uh -huh. by all the things that have happened to you, yeah. and uh, radicalized, as they might have said in the 60s. And, um, and so now you're at the point where you really have a view from both ends, right. you know? Right. And that's very valuable. Yes, I've toured the overt and the covert economy. There you go. There you go. <laughs> And, uh, and, and you have the open mind to be able to keep inquiring and keep staying right. open and keep pushing the envelope as well right. and, and the courage to do so. So that combination is a killer combination and, um, and we want to pursue all of that with you and, and see where right. you've been going and, and where you might be going next. So at this moment, um, first of all, just give yourself a brief introduction. Okay. I, I grew up in Philadelphia, and I um, went to the University of Pennsylvania, studied, Ch studied Chinese, uh, and then I went to Wall Street, and ha I went to business school, then went to Wall Street, had a very successful career as a member of the board and uh, partner at Dillon Reed & Company, and uh, left there, we sold the firm, and then I left and went into the first Bush administration as Assistant Secretary of Housing and ran smack dab into all the mortgage fraud, which is related to the black budget, and I left and started an investment bank. I left the Bush administration thinking, you know, the fascists are going to take this technology and kill us all. So I started an investment bank called the Hamilton Securities Group in Washington, and my interest was in figuring out how we could use new technology to help communities basically be financially successful without government money and sort of get the government out of our hair and decentralize, use technology to decentralize the financial system in a very healthy way. So, um, but once again, um, I, we ended up doing a project. We became lead financial advisor for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And, um, and I ended up in, uh, in a squabble with the federal government. We were making a software tool that would allow you to see all the government money in a community through G GIS software. And the reality carries the black budget finances one neighborhood at a time. <laughs> So transparent cash flows in every county make it much harder to, to do the black projects. And so smack, again, we ran into the mortgage fraud. And um, I ended up having uh, litigating with the federal government for 11 years. Ultimately, we were successful. And I settled the litigation. And in the process, what I discovered, I started to do radio shows. And the way part of the, one of the reasons I got into this topic was I, got, I was on Coast to Coast. And I, I got to know so many wonderful people in their audience who convinced me, look, you've got you've to look at this even as a financial matter. So, um, but, but they all kept coming to me for advice w about their money. You know, how do I protect my money from this fraud? And so I, I set, when I settled the litigation, I became an investment advisor. And then we published something called the Solari Report because we get so many questions that we just, you know, every week we try and do a little piece on, and it's mostly, 
how does this impact your health and money and and what do you do about it? So it's a lot about how do I deal with this and how do I make sure I'm successful no matter, you know, all these things that are going on. So that's kind of my day job. Okay, so um, I ha I've, I've watched many of your videos and um, it's always interesting for me because I know very little about the Secret Space Program. It's almost funny that I'm just talking at the Secret Space Program conference because I know very little. You know, what I understand is the history of financial fraud. And you're always making connections between, you know, and I'll never forget watching your interview of Norman Berglin. Is that how you pronounce his name? Bergram, yeah. Bergram, yeah. Excellent. Fascinating, yeah. fascinating interview. And he's describing the Voyager mission and when they started to get the photos back from the Voyager. And a chill went down my back because that's when the Iran-Contra financial fraud exploded. If you look at a lot of the fraud I was cleaning up at HUD, both at his Assistant Secretary of Housing, and then as the financial advisor, you know, suddenly you had this fraud explode through the 80s and it was so like somebody blew a whistle and said, we need trillions of dollars, go get any money any way you can. And I watched his explanation of their fears and I thought, oh, I bet there's a connection. But my favorite moment on Project Camelot, I just have to tell you, was Bob Dean was speaking and he said, and it chill went back down my spine and I use this quote all the time, he said, he said, you know, we have to bring transparency to this because it is the destiny of the children in my family and the children I love to travel the stars. And I just said, woo, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that quote has inspired me for many years. So you That's got that beautiful. all on tape. Thank you. That's a beautiful, yeah. beautiful story. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful man as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So what I want to do here, and it's interesting you bring up Norm Bergram, because uh -huh. I have to say that that's one of our most uh, important interviews, yes. in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and we have a lot of very, very important, important interviews, interviews, so that's yeah. saying something. But this man is, uh, well, I forget his exact age, but he was, I think, over 85, I'm not sure exactly how old, uh, when we interviewed him. Right. And he has since disappeared. Okay. Really? So what happened is that he was living in a house very close to here in Los Altos Hills. Right. And he was living by himself. His wife had passed. And it was just a serendipity that we managed to get in the door and get the interview. And I mean, some, you know, the force was with us, so to right. speak. He had been being made an offer by a group that was going to take him. They were building him an underground, as he told us, an underground lab to start doing his you know, whole work again. Right. So he was very excited. He was still writing a book. Right. I mean, he was just this very active, very elderly man with his just very wide awake brain. And, um, and, and, and then what happened is that he said, oh, and I'm gonna be doing lots of interviews in the public and I, you know, um, they're building me a, 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 you know, a lab and it's all gonna be fine. And I just thought to myself, this is, you know, for whom the bell tolls, it, it's basically this man is going to disappear right. off the scene. They're bringing him back inside. Right. And he had worked underground, not far from here, at Moffett Field, right. uh, on black projects right. Right, for years and years and years. And so here it is. He is gone. His phone was disconnected. He has been gone from, you know, I can't reach him. Right. He's absolutely off the scene since right. then. So you have to say to yourself, is like what happens to these people you know this this is a right. black project scientist who was with them for years he went out to pasture i think they probably thought he was dead but when he did i did the interview with him the man was alive he was you know one of the one of the things i've believed for many years is is uh the way i bless people is i connect with them i become interested in their work and then I call it Mr. Global. Mr. Global buys them away from me, and I say, this is how I bless people. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. So you blessed him. Yeah, you know, well, uh, maybe, we but I mean, they were already on to him, you know, right. even before I showed up, but still, and, and he had been, po I mean, saw in the video, he said he was nearly poisoned. You talked about being right. poisoned a right. number of times. Yeah. And uh, I, I do want to go down that road, but first I want to ask you a couple key questions uh -huh. that just, you know, I really want to connect some dots here, uh, and maybe these are crazy connections, but promise software, okay? Very important. Yeah. The, the, what is, is not understood is how important the digital systems are to permitting massive fraud on a highly centralized basis. Right. You know, the hardest thing for me 
when I was dealing with the litigation with the Department of Justice was sitting down and saying, how could, you know, I've been told about how bad the mortgage fraud was and I didn't believe it. So can I tell stories? Yeah. Okay, so um, one story, and I'll probably tell this tomorrow, was in 19, it was 94 and 95, um, I had somebody working for me who had been a staff to a senior senator on the finance committee and she came to me and said, you know, there's a mortgage banker who's just really bugging the, uh, the senator and really wants an appointment with you. Now, I was at Hamilton Securities, I was in private, and so finally I agreed I would meet with this guy. So this guy walks in and he's got these wire glasses and he's very serious and he's got a huge stack of papers and he says to me, he says, I'm a mortgage banker and the core competency of my family is we've been mortgage banking since the FHA was created in the 30s and we keep a database of every FHA mortgage and related security. So we have, and he said, I brought you a copy of my database and pushed this, this massive thing of paper. I'm like, oh. And, and he says, uh, I was part of a group of people in the Bush administration who got rules, laws passed requiring audited financial statements. So a process began, had just begun where the agency started saying, you know, we can't produce audited financial statements. So, but you would get these different reports. And he said, so, so we've gotten this financial statement from HUD that they've just published. And he said, there's something terribly wrong. And he said, he said in, the, in the mortgage funds, the, at the time FHA had uh, four, it's now two mortgage insurance funds. He said, they say that they have $400 billion of outstanding mortgage insurance. He said, you don't understand, it's many multiples of that. Wow. Now, Kerry, I thought he was crazy. Because <laughs> what he was saying was, the New York Fed, the Department of Treasury, the Department of Justice, and the four Federal Board of Governors are all engaged, you know, with the FHA in massive securities fraud. We're talking trillions of dollars of massive securities fraud. So I thought the guy was nuts. And I said, oh no, keep your database, that's okay, fine. You know, so I was just like, get this nutcase out of my office. And it took me, then when I ended up in the litigation and I, I couldn't understand why it was so important that they steal our software, that, you know, we couldn't get it back, this went on for years. I, I said, okay, I'm gonna unpack what happened and all the different experiences I've had, both as a government official and then as an investment banker, dealing with this kind of fraud. And it took me years of sort of unpacking it and figuring out. You know, I met lots of spooky people who've been doing the fraud who explained to me how it worked. You know, I finally put it together and I realized, oh, you know, that's true. All of these different agencies are engaged in massive fraud. Now, how could that happen and me not know? The way it, it is done, it is so much through the systems and centralized through the digital systems. And the creation of Promise Software was, to me, a very critical moment at which, you know, the, the, the financial fraud could go into hyperbolic turbo drive warp speed, you know, because you take Promise Software and those kinds of digital systems and then you add uh, derivatives and, you know, sort of financial fancy financial engineering, and you're talking about being able to do trillions of dollars of stuff with, with millions of people helping to implement it when they have no idea what's going on because it's, it's done through the digital systems. Okay, so where did your software factor in to Promise Software? Okay, so here's the interesting thing. All of this fraud can happen because the financial system within a place is disassociated from that place. So let me give you an example. You live in a congressional district. You live in a county. You live in a local area where you drive around and see everything. So for example, when I first became Assistant Secretary of Housing, um, I was the largest property manager in the world until the RTC got created. And then I, I'll never forget turning to Lamar Kelly, who was head of property disposition for the RTC, and I said, congratulations, you're now number one, I'm number two. <laughs> And, and Lamar, this would happen to us and this would happen to Lamar, you would get a list of all your foreclosures in a place and you would fly to that place and you would go out and there would be an empty lot. And your inventory says you have 10 homes there, but it's not, it's an empty lot. Okay, now, if you as a citizen get a financial statement for your place, because one of the biggest investments you make in your life is your taxes, the taxes you pay. There is no reason why you can't have a financial a statement for your congressional district, for your Senate, you know, your state, so that you can hold your 
congressman or your legislator responsible for the financial management of the government. Okay, so you could get, you know, a financial statement for New York City. The reason you don't is because you are given financial disclosure, which is completely disassociated from the world you walk around and see and know every day. Okay? Because if you were getting it on a place-based basis, you would say, wait a minute, what do you mean there, there are 10 homes here and we just spent $250,000 per home to create these homes with taxpayer money? This lot is empty. Okay? So, so it undisassociates a lot of the systems that permit all of this kind of fraud. Okay, okay so, so your software was doing this. So when I was Assistant Secretary of Housing, I ordered place-based financial statements be made. And suddenly, boom, I'm out, and the project's canceled. Really? It all that stopped. Fast. Yeah, that how, fast. How fast? Oh, I'd have to go back and look, but pretty fast. Maybe you know, weeks? Within, yeah, within weeks. Weeks. You know, all, a whole bunch of stuff stopped. So I thought, well, fine, I'll just do it privately. We'll just, we'll just collect up all, you know, because most of the data that goes into the federal accounts is supposed to be public, okay? So, so we said, we'll collect up all the data and the database. You know, it's a lot of hard work. It's yeah. boring. It's mundane. And we'll, now that we have GIS software tools, we'll create this wonderful, you know, playful things and we'll put it up on the web. We just, you know, the web was just happening. We'll just put it up. And you can go and dial in and collect all the things and download and make these pretty maps and colors and see where all the money is. And you can, part of the thing is we wanted to align the financial system with people in the environment because you can make money healing the environment or make money making places safer, but you've got to re-engineer the government money. So we thought if the small businesses can see this, well, all sorts of amazing things started to happen. So I'll give you an example. I had a partner, a very successful partner from Wall Street who flew down in 1996 and we had big monitors. We won an award from the American Institute of Architects. You know, we had all these monitors, very high tech and very beautiful offices patterned after a Japanese tea house. So anyway, uh, this guy comes down and he's yelling about how hopeless the government's totally corrupt. And I said, uh, he, was, he was originally Cuban. And I said, look, it's not hopeless at all. I said, I said, where do you live? He said, I live in Bronxville. So we pulled up all the data on Bronxville. And I started to go through it. The first item was $4 million for flood insurance. And Luis goes nuts. He starts screaming in Spanish. I said, what's the matter? He says, Bronxville's on a hill. I've lived there for 30 years. There are no floods in Bronxville. <laughs> So, because, you know, the insurance programs have a lot of the black budget fraud, so I don't wow. know the flood insurance program. But anyway, the next morning I had a call with, we downloaded and gave them a complete download of all the data on Bronxville, all the federal expenditures, the appropriations, the contracts, you know, everything. The next morning I call Luis and his, he, he stands me up for a conference call, which is unheard of, he's always on <laughs> time. So finally I get through to him that afternoon, I said, Luis, we had a conference call. He said... I have been on the phone with the deputy mayor of Bronxville for four hours. I have gone through every item, item by item. He said, all this corruption is going to stop. I said, I thought you said it was hopeless. He said, that was before I had the numbers from my neighborhood. Wow. Okay. Now, there is not a neighborhood in this country where you cannot find, you know, a contractor doing something for 25 to 150 dollars per hour that someone in that neighborhood would love to do for 10 to 15 to 25 dollars plus health care and that job can be teleported in mm. okay or uh, my favorite one is we uh, as financial advisor we were due diligence uh, due diligence in the foreclosure property and I've got to tell you the Oklahoma City story that reminds me but we were we were we were due diligence in the the foreclosure property and we would regularly find neighborhoods where you could buy and rehab a single family foreclosed property in the FHA inventory when the public housing guys were spending $250,000 per unit in the same neighborhood to build or construct new public housing. So I went over to the public housing team, I took one of them out to dinner, and I said, I said, look, we could build four or five homes for the price of one if we just reallocate the money by place, okay? Place-based optimization. And she looked at me and she said, but how would we generate fees for our friends? <laughs> so I said, let's create four homes and just give your friends a check, you know, <laughs> it'll be cheaper. But that's because the opportunity is enormous. Now, I think, I believe one of the reasons that you can't do that is because that disassociation has been what the black budget has driven a truck through. Right. Okay. 
and you had so much of this, I mean, during the bailouts, when you heard numbers, $27 trillion of bailouts, well, I think at that time, $8 trillion would have paid off all the mortgages in the country. So, so you're talking about the kind of mortgage fraud and securities fraud, um, both probably with respect to the mortgage-backed securities, Ginny, Fannie, Freddie, and the Treasury securities. So you're talking about you know, securities fraud with derivatives of just mind-boggling amounts. So my theory is, you know, one of the most interesting things that happened to me, I spent a lot of time trying to understand the relationship between mortgage fraud and narcotics trafficking, and narcotics trafficking by the intelligence agencies. Yes. And one of the things I discovered is whenever you get a group of soccer moms together in a neighborhood and they try and back the narcotics trafficking out, you know, what they discover is, you know, Tony Soprano is running the drugs, and if you back Tony out, the next thing you know, you've got James Bond and black helicopters coming down on your head. And the question was, why? You know, and then you realize, oh, wait a minute, it's a highly centralized model, and literally the black budget guys can't have one neighborhood get out, because then every neighborhood can get out. And one of the reasons that I'm so big on this idea that it's a material omission not to discuss these things, mm -hmm. we need to re-engineer our economy. You know, for years we've kept a false prosperity going in this country by being the big consumer in the global market. So China makes money by selling us stuff. Yes. And we buy that stuff creating debt. You know, we're buying stuff we can't afford. So if you look at the emerging markets, they need to increase their consumption and service economy. We need to reduce our consumption and increase our production. To do that, you have to re-engineer the government money by place. And you can't do that without, the reason Congress is running around looking ridiculous, because there are a lot of talented people in Congress, is they can't touch the black budget. Right. I, have a, I have a great article, I really encourage everybody to read it. It's called Coming Clean Over the Fiscal Cliff. And it gets into why everybody is so stuck and can't talk about the real deal. And the black budget is the 800 pound gorilla in the room yes. on re-engineering the economy. So we have to talk about this. And That's I, you know, it's very uncomfortable for me because, you know, I dive into subjects I know nothing about. One of the reasons I wanted to do the conference is a lot of the people speaking are the people I call to say, well, you know, what should I think about? I don't know, you know, and they're the people I look to to help me understand this thing. But one of the things I know is we cannot rebalance and get our financial system healthy, let alone align it with the environment or people and living things without facing and dealing with this. Do you know what I mean? Okay, about? absolutely. Well, yeah. um, you know, I, I mean, because this is really uh, an area that I've gone down right. the rabbit hole with, right. um, but you're sort of on the surface, connecting uh, all the dots well, on the surface. Here's what I'm saying. As you go down the rabbit hole and look at all that yeah. stuff, what I'm saying is, all of that is not only financially feasible, because that's how much money is disappearing. Yes. And we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars disappearing. Right. And, and an entire global financial system organized to align with this rabbit hole. Yes. You know what I mean? it, it, it's a drain. I mean, you're, you know, right. you're, you're tracking the surface, but once it goes below the surface, right. you no longer know what happens. But you do know that it's draining. You know that you're following the tributaries. Right. And that drain, if you look at our economy on a county level, that drain, it's not just draining the money. It's draining the right. spiritual life, the civic life, the intellectual life. You know, it's turning, nobody can trust each other. You know, it's, it's a corruption, it's a corrosion of the body, of this whole society. It's turning us into a primitive society where the rate of entropy is going, you know, higher and higher well, and higher. Well, I mean, I call it, you know, a host to a parasite relationship. Right. I mean, that's what has happened. I called it the tapeworm. <laughs> so, so the bottom line is right. that we, or this surface earth, has become the host to a parasite that is now bigger, more, uh, more successful, uh, living, you know, maybe as far as some of my whistleblowers say, ten thousand years in advance of where we are. In other words, we're serving them. You know, literally everything, all our sweat, all everything we're doing is going down this this drain right. into this rogue civilization. Right. Right. And I know you know Rich Dolan, and he's talked about that. Right. Um, and, but here's and so what this I don't, is key. Here's what I don't know because I've spent many years now traveling a lot globally and in the United States 
And, you know, what I will tell you is I find no less corruption at the county level. You know, I've been at a very high level in Washington and Wall yes. Street, not to overestimate. I was, you know, I was a very low level person in that world. Okay. And so, but what I will tell you is that they were as much a prisoner of the system in many ways as the people down here. Okay? And you can't explain what's happening. I can't explain what's happening by they're bad. Yeah. Okay, I okay, can't. That's, that's not right. my experience. It's, yeah, this is where I used to go crazy because people love to say, oh, it's their greed. No. It's not their no, greed. No, it's not their greed. You it's know, not. It's not about that. I it's miss, much beyond that. Right. It's, this is a very complex phenomenon. Yes. And it's a very deep system. So let's just look at the overt economy. The overt economy has been on a, a model, an investment model, which I call the central banking warfare model, for 500 years. Everybody, everything. Now, when you change a model, you know, it's like a whole room dancing that has to change from a waltz to, you know, the twist. That's, you know, and try to get everybody to do it together without making a mess. That, you know, so you're talking about something that's very old and very deep mm -hmm. in just the overt economy. God knows what else is going on. So. This trying to change this is is difficult, and and the people who who are you know at at or near the top, it's it's not an easy job, and I personally don't know what they're dealing with. That's part of why I keep looking into this subject. That's why I watch Project Camelot. I'm trying to figure out what is going on and why are these people behaving this way. Well, exactly. Right. Uh, okay, but that gets into like an, an agenda. And the fact is that they don't want to change the dance, at least in the direction you think they want to change the dance. So, but before we get into that, okay. what I still want to stay back at the Promise software level because yeah. I want to talk about how your software became an issue and how Promise kind of, would you say that it gets cobbled onto your software? Or that was the risk? Yeah, what, Promise, what Promise software was, Promise software was made by a company called Inslaw and right. it was basically stolen by the government. Right. My understanding from Bill Hamilton, who was the president of right. Inslaw and sort of the leader of the thing, what Promise software did was allow you to, to draw and conform data from lots of different databases. So before mm -hmm. relational database technology really happened, it could create a re relational databases from legacy systems. Yes. And my understanding is what they did, you know, when I first called Bill, because somebody said, okay, you've got to get to, you know, Bill Hamilton and understand his part of the thing. I called Bill and he said, have you read Black Money by Michael Thomas? And I said, no, he said, read it, call me back. You know, because it's a, I don't know if you've read it, it's great beach reading that helps you, it gives you a real feel for how this stuff works. Yeah, but I've gone, Way beyond okay, that. Yeah. Okay, but but what what you were doing was you were creating a digital system. Yes. Which we now see finally come out with the Snowden revelations, where us where the U.S. intelligence community could basically move into um, everybody else's systems, including the bank settlement systems, any banks that were on the clearing and Law settlement firms. systems. Everybody. You name it. So uh, I mean, we're I, talking police databases. We're, we're, talking, we're talking putting trap doors. I mean, if you look at the yes. software companies that became the successful, they were putting trap doors in that let everybody into. So the American intelligence community was going into financial institutions and everybody else was sucking up data. And I think the power of it was, I have an article called The Data Beast, was that they, uh, that they aggregated it with artificial intelligence. Yes. And what they created was a machinery that allowed them to do extraordinary con control file systems. Mm -hmm. You know, so they took the control file system out of the confessional booth at the local church and moved it into the telecommunication system. That's number one. But the other thing they did was it allowed them to create the ultimate in both relational marketing and insider trading. Uh, you know, it gave them a way of managing the economy, which is extraordinary and many people don't understand. Right. So, so um, you know, I used to see I live in a very poor county. Somebody loses their job, and within 24 hours, the drug dealer is at the door, and Chase is mailing them a credit card with a 30% interest rate. You know, how did they know? You know, it's quite. <laughs> no, it's once you understand relational database marketing. You know, most people look at the U.S. government. Now, when I was, and this will come out. I'll talk about this in the speech probably. When I was assistant secretary, and then when I was the lead financial advisor to HUD, at that time. Um, 
a lot of the information systems and the payment systems, the lead contractor at HUD was Lockheed Martin. Okay. They got, I think when I was assistant secretary, $150 million a year just to run the core systems. I would try and get data, and to get data, I had to get it from a Lockheed system. I couldn't get it. I was the assistant secretary of housing. Lockheed Martin could deny me the basic data I needed as a legal matter to run my operation, you know, to fulfill my fiduciary obligation. Same thing happened when I was a financial advisor. Right. So w when a lot of people look at the government, they see 21 covered agencies and a group of intelligence. I don't see I see five contractors with a giant database, and every one of those agencies is a collection cup. Because now when you go to the government, the government officials are not in charge. Right. Okay. You have a government that doesn't have information sovereignty, and it doesn't have financial sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting, in uh, the early 2000s, there, one of the top civil servants at HUD who retired, just top guy, really fabulous, talented guy, I was on the phone with him and I, I explained to him that there was no one left in, at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, in, I believed, who had any understanding at that point of how the finances worked. The year before, $59 billion had gone missing at HUD. Okay, so you had reports of massive amounts of money just going missing, and I said, he said, this can't be because, you know, in the old days, the budget guys would have stopped it or found it. And I said, there's nobody there. So he said, I don't believe you. So I made him a bet. A year later, he's driving down 40 and calls me and said, beat me at Red Lobster in Jackson. So I drive in and see him. He doesn't want to talk over the phone. And he says, you know, I've called every office, all my old connect. He said, there is no one. I cannot find anyone in the department who knows, who understands what's going on in the operations financially. That's right. And I said, because it's, it's not a person. It's all, <laughs> it's all being run by a small number. I mean, you've read Edwin Black, Black's book on the Nazi, on the Holocaust and how IBM built the no. database. Okay, Edwin Black wrote an absolutely fantastic book about how IBM built the database operations that the Nazis used to do the Holocaust. They could never have really? done the Holocaust without the All right, IBM. yeah, so, so, okay, but I think it's gone a step farther, and that's a whole nother land. Who's the lead Artificial contractor? Intelligence. Right, who's the lead contractor? Uh, well, IBM provides I software. IG Pharma, right? IBM, IBM provides, I think, this makes some of the software this, for the smart meters, but was given, uh, <laughs> my understanding was given the lead contract for the census. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at who's running the databases. Yeah, the Nazis are back in power, right? <laughs> uh, put it this way, the, 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 you know, what's going on is much scarier than what Snowden has revealed. It, exactly, right. exactly. So, um, but okay, so but just one, you know, just to go back here, and that's beautiful, you know, you've covered right. it beautifully, but let me, let me just tie this up one more time. Your software, because I'm curious, what happened with your software? Because I have a feeling, and I don't know if you, you would agree with me, that on some level you were targeted because of your software. I think we were targeted for several reasons, but one was the software. Yeah. Um, we were publishing, you'll see it in my, in my presentation tomorrow, we were publishing maps that showed literally maps of where the defaulted HUD mortgages were in the foreclosures. Mm -hmm. And it was very contiguous. Like we, we published one map on the internet of South Central Los Angeles. And you know, of the and what you could see is the mortgage fraud was directly related to what was happening with the with the Dark Alliance drug dealing. Yes. And the, the Gary Webb had just published his article and that was all happening. I didn't realize it because I was being hit with subpoenas and all stuff, but we were publishing these pictures of the mortgage fraud and I had no, I didn't know anything about the narcotics trafficking. So well, I would look at the map and I didn't realize that these maps were telling things nobody wanted to told. And of course that was during the whole debate about the CIA memorandum of understanding. I won't go down. But, but what year was that? 96. 96. 96. Our, a lot of the fiercest, they came in and seized, you know, they, they kept coming and trying to get control of our digital infrastructure. And um, it's a long, complicated story. It's up all up on the internet. If you go to dunwalkie.com, um, I wrote an article and explained it all. Yeah, I read, I, I did do did some, some homework. Okay, here. so 
So, um, but they seized the offices, and I'm trying yeah. to remember the date they seized the, you know, they kept coming in waves because you could tell they wanted something, and they weren't satisfied until they seized the offices, and while they were in the offices, they tried to falsify information. Luckily, we caught them, but then they put all, everything under a digital record. I had to take all of my records, nothing. You know, I started off, I literally woke up the morning after every piece of data including my, you know, my personal address book, was under court control and we had to start from scratch. You know, my Christmas card file, everything wow. was in. And it took me six years to get those files out of the special master. Now, in the meantime, they put in charge, they hired as their contractor to help them manage them, the number one contractor to the U.S. government on GIS software. <laughs> Khaki. Right. So, um, so when I finally got them, it took me six and a half years and millions of dollars to get them back. And when I got them back, all the most valuable pieces were gone forever. Yeah. So, you know. So, they, but, but did your did they actually steal the software in the end, or did you get it this, back? The software was in many different pieces. Mm -hmm. So um, there were some pieces that were gone. There were some pieces I had, and I took, it was funny, I, I approached the Free Foundation software, I approached the Internet Archive, I approached several places about, you know, sort of taking everything, making it accessible so open source developers could see what they could do with it. They were scared to death. They wanted nothing oh, really? to do with it. Yeah. And I think it's now that people are beginning to understand, first of all, it has taken many, many years for people to believe what I was saying about the extent of the mortgage fraud because it was so extraordinary. You know, one of the reasons we wanted to do this conference, Carrie, was so that people could understand how could this hidden system of finance, you know, this hidden system of finance grew like the fire under the ground and then during 2006 to 2012, it yeah. just burst up and it, it's as though it has overwhelmed the whole you know, regular system of finance. I used to right. say 9-11 was how they got the black budget off budget to on budget. And if you look, <laughs> no way, if you look at how they changed sort of the financial mechanisms and what happened on 9-11, it really, you know, that was part of it. So the bottom line is you've got, they, they took your software and this is one of the ways in which they were able to shut you down, would you say? Right. Okay. But it was also, mo the most important thing was it made it feasible to dramatically increase the amount of mortgage fraud because they implemented the MERS system. I don't know if you're aware of what MERS is. No. But, but by implementing the MERS system and shutting down Community Wizard, it meant they could issue many more mortgages than there were homes. So let me give you an example. In 1994, we were, my company was the lead financial advisor for the Federal Housing Administration. And I had seen the FHA internal plans on increasing the number of mortgage originations they were going to do in poor neighborhoods. And um, several months later, they, uh, the same office came out with an announcement where they were, uh, had reached an agreement with Freddie and Fannie about how many mortgages they were going to originate in the same neighborhood. And I looked at the numbers, Carrie, and I realized that's more homes you know, they were, gonna, they were planning on originating more mortgages between Freddie, Fannie, and FHA than there were homes. And I said to a very high-level official, I said, wait a minute, you, there's something very wrong here. You're talking about, you know, people are going to have to refinance their mortgages twice from prison, you know, a year to make these numbers. And she, she turned to me and she said, shut up, this is none of your business. Really? Right. Now this is this is 1994-95 that that time frame because if you look at the housing bubble it took thousands of changes in laws and regulations at the Federal Housing Administration at HUD at the Department of Treasury at the Department of Justice at Freddie at Fannie the nuts and bolts of engineering the housing bubble took a lot of work. Oh. Okay. So this was coming from the highest levels of the financial system, and, and I mean government. You know, so this was a bubble engineered intentionally by government. And they knew. They knew it was going to be fraudulent. They could not, you know. Okay, but what's interesting about that is that so we have at a certain level of government knowledge 
But the question is, did they know why they were doing what they were doing? In other words, probably maybe they knew payoffs were going certain places and they were supposed to allocate those payoffs. But did they really know the depth to with which, or do they even know today, of what they're really a part of? I think, you know, what different people n know is, you know, it's very, the knowledge is very dispersed. I think what a lot of people thought is we're going to pull as much capital as we can from the developed world and shift it and invest it in the emerging markets. Really? So I think, well, the D WTO had just been passed, the Uruguay round of GATT had just been passed, and you know, if, if I was going to tell you to watch one video to understand the economy today besides the, you know, what's going on covertly, watch Sir James Goldsmith in 1994 come to the United States and go on Charlie Rose and basically say, this is financial insanity. We're going to destroy our society by doing this kind of, you know, by, by, by globalizing labor and competing labor in countries where people make a dollar a day against the developed world, you're going to basically bankrupt the middle, you're going to destroy the middle class in the developed world. So this was all understood and known. And so, so this was part of the, what's called the rebalancing of the global economy. And I think a lot of people thought we're pulling money out and we're shifting it to Asia, we're shifting it to abroad. And I don't, you know, I think the, the understanding of the extent of the fraud or of the general model, a lot of people were on a need to know basis and didn't see the big picture. Well, along those lines, did you ever talk to Karen Hudis about what was going on with the IMF? No, I, when I first, somebody first asked me to watch her descriptions when she first started to talk and frankly I didn't find her, I did not find her information either compelling or useful and just said you know I'm I'm not gonna really so yeah so I just my my and now I was looking at her stuff at the World Bank but for anybody to be at the World Bank that long and not notice there were and if you look at what she was talking about whistleblowing it was you know, it's sort of minor stuff, a lot of which I considered irrelevant. So I just... But it, 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 it does have to do with, uh, you know, a system. I mean, have you read The Economic Hitman and all of that? Yeah, and that was... A, I wrote an article. I was very uncomfortable with that material. And I think it was very useful because, you know, Greg Pallast and Ann Williamson had done extraordinary reporting on the kind of financial transactions and fraud that the economic hitman book described. But the juice in that book was he was saying, I was doing it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So, so that, for a lot of people, that made it more juicy. But if you look at that first book, he very much stops short and says, oh, well, this is sort of a giant accident. People really didn't know what was going. You know, which is complete, yeah, yeah. This was being run top down. Yes. You know, the people in charge know exactly what they're doing. It's, you know, so. Right. It, it was kind of like a modified hangout. And I found it very offensive, particularly because you had reporters doing great reporting that wasn't modified hangout. Okay. Now, okay. what I discovered was because he'd been doing it personally, I think it was very useful to a lot of people to say, okay, well, you know, right. they relate to the intimate story of somebody doing the fraud. Well, yeah, and there was sort of this, you know, sort of spy, you know, in the right. fold kind of thing right. going on with it. Um, okay, so but but you so you understood that that was going on. Did you understand it back in the days when you were, you know, in in the housing office? I, you know, something I I never believed that the fraud could be anywhere as bad as it was without me knowing about it. And you also had a certain sense of we're stuck, we're struggling to choose between options that are all bad options. So I certainly had a sense of the covert economy. It's very interesting. The, the you know the Bushies, the first Bush administration, there was great effort to kind of keep the covert and the overt separate. You know, separate worlds, and a lot of attention was being paid to kind of making it look you know the appearance and. You know, and you had to be careful. And it was funny because the Clintons had lived in a small state, you know, which was much more intimate. And it was during the Clinton period. And I think part of it was people were just getting more and more tired with the pretense. You know, you kind of blew through a lot of the financial controls. And every administration seemed to get more and more kind of out of control. And I think part of it was you literally had this hidden financial system kind of 
overwhelm and overtake the overt system at some point. So it, you know, it was a it was a tendency. Okay. Yeah. So so you kind of rode that wave in a sense. Yeah, and I I kind of believe I wasn't that interested in the fraud. I was like, how can we use the new technology to build enough of a learning metabolism economically? and realign things. So here's the problem. The problem with what's happening in the economy is you're destroying wealth. You're centralizing wealth, so you're building these huge pools of capital, but you're destroying wealth. So what I was interested in is how do we realign so we can create so much more wealth that we can have enough wealth to do extraordinary space program, travel the galaxy, all these different things, but have you know a healthy life here on Earth. Mm -hmm. So what I was looking is where's the jump the curve opportunity to really realign and create wealth, and I couldn't understand why. You know why? Why is genocide so attractive? I'll never forget. I said to I found a guy who'd been doing the financial fraud for the Office of Naval Intelligence at one point, and I said to him, you know, I said, Harry, you're so clever. I could teach you how to make more money honestly. And he looked at me like I had just punched him in the stomach, and he said. I would never make money, honestly. I mean, it's like real men do fraud. And I thought, you know, what is the, it was kind of like, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, it's sissies do honest investment, but that's sissy stuff. It's kind of know? like a, yeah, mafia don <laughs> attitude. Yes, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, mano, mano, we do this. Right. Uh, but no, I, Okay, so, so, but you have also come out recently talking about, you know, the link to black projects much more overtly than you used to. And you're also linking it to UFOs. And one of the statements, I, I watched a video in which you're talking about right. the, the amount of technology in the skies, you know, has to come from somewhere. And it's basically, how can it be produced on Earth? All that, you hardware. know, hardware, as you called it. Right. Um, and I, you know, I thought that was a great kind of no-brainer kind of statement, but it, it, you know, that people had been overlooking, you know, people that want to be right. in denial about all of this. Um, well, I pro I'm a person who prices everything out. Okay. So you know, if you show me a documentary and with lots of different video shots of UFOs, my mind is automatically thinking, okay, how much did it take to build that? How much does it take to run that? What kind of crew does it need? What, you know, I'm yeah. doing the budget for that thing. Yes. And, and you know, one of the things I've always, you know, a lot of the reason I stayed away from this topic was I knew nothing about it. And intermittently, I would go in and try and read, and I'd just tear my hair out. I just, I can't make any sense of it. I just can't figure it out. And I had no personal experience, you know, it just, so it's kind of a blank, and it took many years, but then I found Richard Dolan's book, and then yes. I found Joseph Farrell's book. Right. And jo Joseph and Richard were, the, were two of the people as well, some of the Project Hamlets, like the interview we were talking about. So, so I found a series of people who I started to feel were very grounded, the research was very solid, mm -hmm. and they could make enough sense out of it to me so that I, as a financial person, I could relate. And so I started to kind of collaborate with them and, and I don't try and learn that area, but what I do is I try and help them understand the financial stuff. And then we, met, you know, because I'm this side of the balance sheet, they're that side of the balance sheet. And I'm saying, oh, you know, this fits here and this fit, you know. So, yes. so it wasn't until I could find enough people and get it enough distilled so that it could, you know, it could, it could snap on like the puzzle pieces. Right, so, you, you, so you, you pierce the veil, you started going through and fi fi following the money, so to speak. Well, All the way? Right. Well, here's what happened. I believe that what happened between 92, I mean, for many years we've had this hidden system of finance. We've had, um, uh, you know, we went through a period where literally the hidden system of finance overwhelmed the over financial system. That's what the bailouts and the financial crisis were. And I really feel now that we've gone through what I, I call a financial coup d'etat, a change in control. Right. And so we're now in a very different world and system than we've ever been before. As of when? Um, as of two things. We, we engineered the bailouts, and then the Federal Reserve continued with quantitative easing. I believe had a shredding party, because they're buying up, I think, a huge amount of fraudulent paper and essentially 
shredding it while it's on their balance sheet. So, so I think between the bailouts and quantitative easing, um, we both uh, cleaned up a lot of the fraud, paid a lot of people and things off. Um, think of it this way, it's like a leverage buyout, except instead of buying out the a company, you're buying out the planet. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so you issue $40 trillion of fraudulent paper, then you use that to get control of the financial mechanism, then once you've got control of the financial mechanism, you have the bailouts and you use that to shred and cover up the paper. And then you wait for the statute of limitations to be over, and then you're out the other side, the coup's over. Okay? And you got your cash when you issued the phony baloney paper. Right. Okay? Now it looks like they've probably got more cash. I'm grossly oversimplifying, but essentially... Okay, what about the idea that, that some of the money, the, the bailout money, went to England? You've heard that, right? Well, I, here's the big question, where did the money go? And usually in a situation like this, it's not just one place. Right. But I suspect, so, so let me give you, my number for the financial coup d'etat was, was about $40 trillion went someplace. Now, I think some of it went into the emerging markets to rebalance the global economy. So you pull capital out of the mature economy and you reinvest it in the high growth economy. So some of it was rebalancing the global economy. But there was enough money left over to basically create a private endowment that could produce dividends and interest sufficient to run a world government without taxpayers. Okay, so you notice we go into a budget sequestration, they're talking about cutting the, 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 the defense budget, but Lockheed Martin's stock keeps going up. Why yeah. is that? Yeah. Okay, so I think these guys saw what was coming and they said, look, we can spend this money on nursing homes or we can take it out now, pull it out of the retirement funds, pull it out of, you know, and, and, and create enough of a financial juggernaut that we can continue to run whatever we want to run on a private endowment basis. Okay, so that's another possibility. I think the black budget projects, you know, need, need as Joseph was talking about, secret money. So it's not just the money that's getting clawed out from other, other agencies in the sort of technical black budget, but it's the secret sources of financing. Yeah. So I think a huge amount of money has gone there. And well, what about? Uh, are you aware of of the, um, the what they call the the trading programs, the high collateral, um, high yield, the high frequency? High. Yeah. You know where it's uh, the investment. The minimum investment is something like I don't know if it's a hundred, it's a hundred thousand, hundred million. I don't even know. I've I've bumped into them and avoided them. So, but you have, yeah. So I've bumped into them. Okay, but, but when you say you've bumped into them and avoided them, what? It, why? Why are you saying that? What I mean, because a person like you would seem to be. Did you ever read the White Hat reports, for example? No. There's a group of, uh, you know, it's called Dr. Oh, oh, the, yeah, Blogspot, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. they were writing yeah. reports about. They started to get into where the black money went where the Black Project money came right. from. And one of the big things is supposed to be the trading programs. And so I wonder, you know, you didn't, would, here's the problem, when you, when you go down, when you get into that all, all that stuff, you run into a world which is so, there's so many different ways to get burnt. And there's so much fraud going on. It's almost as though you know, I'm a person who enjoys an enormous amount of protection. You know, I don't want to go down that world because I lose my protection. Really? Yeah. So this is spiritual. But that's, that's amazing. Okay, well, what about uh, the golden lily? You know, I, I don't know if you heard the whole thing. That, right, I know this story. Because when he starts going to golden lily, this is actually trading program money uh, sort of is, is wrapped in there. Um, you know, the Indonesian right. government trying to bring these bonds. You know, the whole Neil... Keenan thing. Uh, I don't know if you follow. Here, here's what I've tried to do. What I, I'm a great believer that uh, you know I, I'm interested in building an economy that builds real wealth, and a lot of the trading programs are basically ways of skimming from the system through a debasement process, and it's the whole it's a whole kind of draining wealth that I just don't want to be involved in. It's just a, it's a, you know, it's just, uh, 
you know, whether it's spiritually or financially. But I mean, you know it's going on. I we'll suspect say that. it's going on. I don't know of a way to get reliable information. Okay. I, know, I know of a way to get tons of information, but I don't know of a way to get any reliable information on it. Okay, so in terms of your situation though, because you're, you know, you're, maybe you're entering a land that you don't even, you know, you don't know the boundaries of that land. You may sense them when we feel more danger, you're in more dangerous right. territory than others, but like you say, you don't know the lay of the land, you don't know the end, you know, you don't know the perimeter, you don't know when right. you're on the edge of that, that, that right. land. Because it is, I mean, let's face it, most of us topsiders, so to speak, don't know that, okay? Right. All right. Right. So, but you've, you've skirted into the, onto the edges every once in a while. That was like when uh, John, uh, you know, uh, from the Arlington Institute uh, offered you the luncheon where right. you might, you know, meet some people, right? Right. Um, that was one of those opportunities to see the, to go to the edge, right? Maybe. I mean, we don't, you... I don't, you to didn't this know day, that I don't know. know. You think maybe that was a way to take you offline, uh, to I, lie to you, here's to the make thing. you a, a woo-woo person. And I don't know if that was a legitimate, you know, I have no idea You don't what know was. if that was a legitimate offer. Right. Okay. I don't know if that okay. was a legitimate offer. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, but at this moment, you know, because you're putting two and two together, you would acknowledge that, look, there are craft up there, right? And they can, they come from somewhere. Right. Maybe our underground bases, there's no right. such thing as ET, let's say, in that land. Um, and you can see there's a budget. Here, and, here's and what I'm saying. Okay. I have subscribers and I have clients. Yes. This is relevant to their financial life. Yes. In other words, their financial life is in jeopardy and at risk because of this. Yes. And I want to make sure that as, as safe as they can be and as well as they can navigate, that they have the information and knowledge they need to navigate, but they need to know that this stuff is going on and could impact, you know, their choices in life, in, you know, whether it's health, whether it's where they go to school, what they do with their time, what jobs they get. You know, before they decide they want to go work for a defense contractor, they better know they could go down this rabbit hole. So I want them to have an understanding of opportunities and risks. So to me, I have, you know, this is an ethical issue. I have, it is a material omission for me to pretend that this stuff is not happening. Now, I don't begin to understand it, but I do know that we know enough, you know, if you read Richard or, or Joseph's latest books, we have very credible, serious intellectuals who've done the research, who've aggregated the information, they can read it, they can connect it to their day-to-day -day life, and they can start to make wiser choices. Right. You know, when I, I spend a lot of time with people helping them clean themselves up from financial fraud or health fraud or other things that have really hurt them financially or physically because they didn't know. Yes. If they knew, they could have navigated more successfully. They could have known, oh, stay away from the, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so I want to make sure that the people I'm responsible for have better maps because I want to make sure that they choose you know, they choose what they want. You know, they, they have the map they need to achieve their purpose in life instead of continually, you know, it's like bumper cars out there. You know, they're getting into bumper cars and smashing into each other and making all sorts of choices that waste their time, waste their money, put them in debt because they didn't know. Right. Well, I mean, even this housing thing linked up with the drugs, linked up with the, the secret government that's using right. those drugs to funnel into the black projects, et cetera. Right. They're not going to allow someone like you to set up a database that tracks all of that on surface, right? And that's, in essence, your link. So you didn't know you had a link, but now you have a link, right. all, a through line, so right. to speak. And by the same token, they don't know that the aerospace industry is not going downhill no matter what they say about money not being available, that these contracts here's, are, 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 are going to be there forever. Here's the, the last time, you know, I sort of got into this. I, for many years, I've been part of different financial groups who say the economy is going to collapse. And I say, no, it's not. It's going to slow burn. 
And this goes on and on and on. And I have many of the who are friends and we're close and they say, we get on the radio and they say, the economy is the financial system. I said, no, it's not. It's going to slow burn. And the reason, the difference between us is because I understand how they use the information technology. I understand the black projects. I understand, you know, it's this whole understanding that is behind this, you know, me yes. saying the slow burn. So, so finally we got into last year and you had just shrieking from these whole groups, the economy's going to collapse. I said, no, it's not going to collapse. It's not going to collapse at all. Are you kidding? These guys have just stolen $40 trillion. They're sitting pretty. And if you go to the areas of the country where they're reinvesting, the economy's booming. Like you here, know. hello. <laughs> so, so I said, you know, I, I finally said, I've got to find a way because I, I was getting really concerned I would have people come to me who would made terrible financial choices because they believe these guys. You know, and they're absolutely, the end of the world is coming, it's going to go, I was like, no. So I said, for our, we do an annual wrap-up every year on the Solaria Report. So for the annual wrap-up, I spent a lot of time with, um, with Joseph. You know, I would stop and talk with him, and we, we kind of figured it out. We got this picture of, okay, here's, here's they've shifted the money out, and here's what's growing. And, and this, right. is come, this is growing and this is dying and there's right. a transition going mm -hmm. on. We called it breakaway, the breakaway. Yeah. And, so, um, and so I did a big wrap up where I described the breakaway and from a point of view of, okay, here are the parts of the economy that are growing and here are the parts that are going to be. And a lot of it organizes around the smartphones, believe it or not. The smartphones yes. are a very, very important thing to understand what's going on. And it was amazing because I then went out to a conference after I prepared a lot of the information and I walked into this room and you had 400 presentations from people about the global financial system. So on its last legs, it's going to collapse. And then I get up there and say, I don't think so. And I start off in the first part of the presentation, I mentioned the black budget and I wish you'd been there because at the end, the first question a woman stood up, she said, I'm one of your subscribers. She said, you're not going to want to hear this, but I don't think anybody in this room has ever heard of the black budget or knows what it is. So could you explain what the black <laughs> budget is? I said, oh, this is really scary. You know, cause the, and, and so you have all of these people sitting around making financial choices without the kind of map they need to make wise financial choices. Yeah. So this is bigger because <clears throat> once the financial coup was over, you know, the train left the station. The breakaway civilization is proceeding. Absolutely. They are proceeding at lightning speed. Yeah. And and we're all sitting around, <laughs> you know, and what we don't understand is no, we are being collapsed, but yeah. the economy is not being collapsed. Yeah. So that their deal is actually, you know, running on steroids at the moment. It's stronger than it's ever been. Yeah. It's exactly. it's unbelievably yeah. strong. Yeah. Um, okay, well and and that's you know, that's just awesome that you get that. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, but what I would say, I would expand one part, and I would say that you're saying financial, you know, understanding the financial system is one thing, but also understanding the political, in other words, system. So you can't make a, a choice about where to live, right? Where to, you know, what part of the globe to live, uh, what government to live under, anything. If you don't understand that there's this whole world right. going on. In which, yes, the money's all funneling, but also all the all the talent. They're they're draining right. the talent pools. Right. The children are being right. recruited into. Right. Um. So it, it it's it's every layer of right. of, of, of our lives. Right. It's not just one. Right. You know, one. Layer. There's been a change of control. Yeah. There's been a change of yeah. control, and it's very significant. And you need to understand that this is happening, and it changes everything about, yes. as you were saying. What choice do you make about a career? Right. Uh, where do you invest your money, as you were saying, uh, and the retirement? One, the one. Now, I don't even know. See, I don't. This is interesting, and I don't know. You know, I don't know anything about this area. I don't know anything about insurance either. And you're, you know, that's obviously right. a huge rabbit hole right. in itself. But how can you have a retirement when the economy isn't built? For that, you know what I mean. It's not. It doesn't care about that anymore. Right. It's 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 really not about saving people and keeping them alive for X number of right. years, other than through pharmaceuticals and using them as gu guinea pigs. Well, I, f I forget the exact. I think the the uh, a woman uh, my age or older 
who does not have uh, who, who does not have a high school education. Since 1991, I think their average life expectancy has dropped six years. So you're you know one of the ways they're going to balance the budget and the social security is life expectancy is coming down. And to me, one of the most important things we can do if we understand what's going on financially in the retirement system and in the social safety net is really take charge of our own health. Yeah. You know, really take charge of your own Absolutely. health. Absolutely. Because if you do, if you really understand that you cannot trust the system and that you have to be your own doctor mm -hmm. and you have to take the time to really invest proactively in being healthy, yes. it can make an enormous difference. Yes. Another one that I really care about is I've worked with some wonderful young people on, okay, here's your budget. Here's how much money you have to get a college and graduate education. What's your learning plan? What do you want to learn? And how do you get that in very granular ways and make it economic? And what they discover is, rather than just go through an automatic route, they just say, okay, I need this. I go here for this thing and this thing and this thing, but I need a fancy degree. I'll get that here. And, and suddenly they're navigating the system as a very smart consumer knowing I don't take out any student loans, and you know, I do it here, that, you know, I can't yes. trust the system, they're all going to lie, they're going to yes, trick me, yes. and there's 5,000 courses, I can spend 20 years in the, in the university, and all I'm going to get is disinformation. Right. One of my favorite subscribers wrote to me, and she said, she was, she said, uh, I'm in college, and she said, I have to take history classes, I'm required, and she said, but it's really great, I have all of your stuff on my iPod. And when they start to lie, I just put in my <laughs> earplugs, and then you tell me the truth, and I just sit there and you know. <laughs> yeah, scary stuff. Uh, but it, it's great, you know. It's great to have someone like you who's out there, sort of yeah. having really had their hand on the pulse of what's going on on, on this very, very uh, practical level, you know, of everyday life in terms of, you know, I mean, who would think there was this incredible link? between mortgages and housing, housing right. on, you know, certainly in the United States, but I think this is worldwide. We're talking real estate, you know, right. um, bottom line. Uh, you know, and then that, that all relates to the drug trade and right. where that blossoms and then to also black right. projects and, right. and, and so on. Right. And it must it, also have to do with, um, I don't know what you call, but endowments and where, the, where they give money, yes. like certain areas of the country, getting stuff right. and the other areas not. The, the hardest thing for most Americans is they know something's wrong. Yes. And they have to spend an enormous amount of time pretending that this official reality is true when they know it's not. Yeah. You know, but for them, it's, they don't want to go there. They're just like, please let me get through the day. So, so, so they need a way of navigating this, which is energizing for them and doesn't waste their time and money. And, and so the question is, how can we help them see what's going on in a way which is easy? That's why I always use movies, because one of the things I learned is, you know, a lot of this stuff is scary or depressing. So how could I use movies, because they're just too tired at the end of the day to like look at some of this stuff. Right. How could I use movies to make it interesting? That's why you doing videos, the more we do videos, I think the easier it is for them. Yeah. So, so. So what we need to do is kind of help them escape the Orwellian, you know, they need to be effective within the system because they gotta pay their rent. You know, so they're going into the system to get the money to pay their rent and that's how it has to be. But how can they navigate it in a way where they can get along and not seem strange to anybody so they can navigate it successfully, but they know enough so they don't get tricked. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and that becomes the name of the game also because they're gonna, you know, these people are being deceived right, left, and center. Uh, and, right. and that, whether it's a health product they buy or, a, you know, some kind of treatment they go for that's just gonna kill them anyway, um, right. you know, and so on. Um, okay, well, I mean, we, you know, I've kept you for quite a bit of time here and I don't. <laughs> this was I, our 10 minutes, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but but I, I want to, you know, just wrap this uh -huh. up in, a, in, a, in sort of a, a good way. In terms of your own livelihood, I mean, I can see where you're kind of, you, you had to go through a time when they took you down, you dealt with it, you fought back, and you seem right. to have been very successful in sort of regaining your footing, so to speak. 
I think, you know, I'm nowhere near where I want to get to. Okay. So I want to get to the point where my businesses are thriving and I'm enjoying what I do. You know, the first five years is oh, when you're an entrepreneur, you know, you start something and yes. stuff. But it's beginning to finally click in. Mm -hmm. So I'm very optimistic about where it's going. And, um, and I like, you know, I like my life. I work, I used to work with people I didn't admire or respect. You know, not when I was, I, when I was on Wall Street, I worked with people I very much liked and very much respected. In the Bush administration, I had to work with a lot of people I didn't like and I didn't respect. And also, you know, when I was doing Hamilton Securities Group, I was in Washington. Now I work with people I love. And I work for people I love. And I work for people I admire and respect a great deal. Mm -hmm. And day to day, I deal with great people. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm, I like to think that the quality of people that I do business with has improved enormously. <laughs> so it's, you know, so it's, I'm in that young period of building, but uh, that's what I like about it. I like the day to day. I, I deal with very enlightened, very nice people. Okay, now it seems to me, I'm just going to give you a sort of a challenge here. It seems to me that you're dealing with people like to, to allow them to sort of adjust to the system, okay, but not to bucket necessarily. Maybe bucket sort of in a very covert way such that they can still maintain a facade so that they don't, they don't get targeted. So I, here's the thing. I end this lawyer report every week where I say, don't worry about if there's a conspiracy. If you're not in one, you need to start one. Because I grew up in a world where okay. conspiracies were how we organized everything. All right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and conspiracies weren't necessarily illegal, mm -hmm. you know, but it was just you get together with a group of people, you come up with a plan, plan. and then you do it, you yeah. know. So that was the organizing principle of the universe. I was like, what's wrong with this? This is great. This is how you do things. Yeah. So, so, you know, what I want to see, what I believe is that we have the power to change this entirely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, part of it is to change something, you need to understand it. And the, the reality is I've spent my whole life trying to understand who's running things and why they're behaving this way. And to this day, Carrie, I don't know. that. You know, I can't sit down and tell you. Sure. You know, I can engage in conjecture, but I don't know. Right. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this conference is to try and improve our, you know, to lessen the how much we don't know. But, but I still don't know. Mm -hmm. But I do know that... The human race has the power. You know, our freedom comes to us by divine authority. And we have the power to choose freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, I, you know, I went through that process where I said, okay, I'm going to choose freedom. They're going to kill. I was sure. I was sure I had no chance to live. And I made it. You know, but it was a miracle. Miracles happen when you make that choice. Yeah. So we have to make that choice. Now, tomorrow, I can say this to you because you're a very attractive woman. Tomorrow, if every woman went up and said, every man who's doing anything evil or genocide, gets no sex, all of this would stop. <laughs> Is it true? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. So the, one of the most powerful books I wrote, I'm giving you my whole speech from tomorrow, was Robert Axelrod's The Evolution of Cooperation, where he says if we bring transparency to who's doing you know, true evil, they'll be shunned. Shunned oh, absolutely. absolutely. So if the human race woke up and said, you know, I'm not going along with this. I'm not doing it. I'm not, you know, I'm going to laugh at it. Now, when we do that, we have to have a vision of how we could re-engineer the money so that it can be sustainable. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to deal with the nuts and bolts of how you make it work. So we need a picture of success where we can get from here to there. But the minute we see that and we start shunning, so what I try and do on the Solaria Report is, is show people where they can gather their power. Uh -huh. And the more you just say no, you know, you sent me, I wrote a I couldn't believe it. I wrote a letter to, I had worked at Goldman Sachs for the summer, and if you're a Goldman Sachs alumni, you get, your, you get an email and you get on there, you get their research, and I wrote them and I said, you guys are scumbags. Delete me from your list. You know, I, wrote, I, I don't want your research. You know, go jump in a lake. And, and I, I then published my letter, and um, you know, I think we need to all do that. We need to hold people. You know, I'll sit down at a dinner party and say, Goldman Sachs, I said, well, you know, you're the scumbag that's responsible. Are you, I'm amazed you're not worried that somebody will shoot you, you know, and if they, if they do shoot you, I will try and defend them in the court of law saying it was self-defense. So, you know, we need to hold people in our lives accountable. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a matter of bringing transparency and taking the action. 
If everybody in America pulled their money out of all the banks that are doing the fraud, it would shift. Yeah. You know, as alternative media, as you, as the Solari Report, as all the people who are here do what they do, it's forcing the mainstream. I was in the Midland, Texas airport. I was there on business. And I don't own a television set, but I was in the deli, in the airport, and the deli was turned on as one of the top financial shows. It was all my stuff. <laughs> it was whole sentences and paragraphs from you know my most recent stuff. They, they're trying to hold the space, do you know what I mean? And yes. they're having to shift because we're True. shifting. They are. So we have, I believe we have the power to change it, but we need to change it in a way, you know, take my subscriber, that person's being drained. I need to teach them how to change this to reduce the drain. And every time they reduce the drain, they get more energy to do the next thing. Yes. So we need to do this in a way, you know, to some people it would seem incremental, but I want them to have successful lives and I want them to thrive. Mm -hmm. And I want them to thrive by pulling away from the thing that's draining them. Right. So think of it this way, it's like having a parasite. Mm -hmm. If you cut off that which is feeding the parasite and draining you, the parasite get, gets weaker and you get stronger. Yeah. And that's what we have to do. So. Okay. All right, I think that's a good ending. Thank okay. you very Thank much you. for Thank you for everything you do. Humanity. run-of-the-mill stuff and, and, and just jump around a bit because right. we, we're probably in, on limited time here right. and I'm sure you're tired and you know, it's been going on all day and uh -huh. you're kind of like... It's great though, it's very energizing. Yeah? yeah. Oh, yeah. All, right. all right, cool. Well, you're kind of the center of attention at the moment uh, at the conference, I think, and I, I'm sure there's a reason for that because, uh, you know, it's very interesting to be part of the sector as I have for over eight years and uh, what happens with people is that they come onto the scene and especially if you have a background in sort of what we call the mainstream uh -huh. and you are a renegade from the mainstream and you've been pushed out of the game uh -huh. by all the things that have happened to you yeah. and uh, radicalized as they might have said in the 60s and, um, and so now you're at the point where you really have a view from both ends right. you know? right. and that's very valuable. Yes, I've toured the overt and the covert economy. There you go. There you go. And, uh, and, and you have the open mind to be able to keep inquiring and keep staying right. open and keep pushing the envelope as well right. and, and the courage to do so. So that combination is a killer combination. And, um, and we want to pursue all of that with you and, and see where right. you've been going and, and where you might be going next. So. At this moment, um, first of all, just give yourself a brief introduction. Okay. I, I grew up in Philadelphia, and I um, went to the University of Pennsylvania, studied, I studied Chinese, uh, and then I went to Wall Street, and ha I went to business school. Then Hi, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and I'm here with Catherine Austin Fitz. And we're at the Secret Space Program Conference, which is uh, up in San Mateo, California. And it's really in the belly of the beast as far as black projects and Secret Space Program go. Um, so this is a great honor to, to be it's talking to you. It's a great honor. I've been, I've been watching your videos for <laughs> years. <laughs> All right, well, well, thank you. So I guess it's mutual admiration society, as they say. Um, I, I want to say that, you know, we just did get a clip with you with C. Uh -huh. Bassett, and that's yeah. going to kind of predate this uh, on, the, on the interview. And it was great, some great um, authentic sort of Stories. live conversational, yeah. you know, anecdotal material. Uh, so what I want to do here is just back up a little bit. Uh, okay. I want you to give your background just for the people that may view sure. this and don't know about you and, and this will be their first exposure. And then 
I want to drill down into some things that you've been releasing lately. Okay. Um, we're kind of going to leapfrog over a lot of this. So I, I got to know so many wonderful people in their audience who convinced me, look, you've got to, you've got to look at this even as a financial matter. So, um, but, but they all kept coming to me for advice w about their money. You know, how do I protect my money from this fraud? And so I, I set, when I settled the litigation, I became an investment advisor. And then we published something called the Solari Report because we get so many questions that we just, you know, every week we try and do a little piece on, and it's mostly how does this impact your health and money and, and what do you do about it? So it's a lot about how do I deal with this and how do I make sure I'm successful no matter, you know, all these things that are going on. So that's kind of my day job. Okay, so. Um, I ha I've, I've watched many of your videos, and um, it's always interesting for me because I know very little about the Secret Space Program. It's almost funny that I'm just talking at the Secret Space Program conference because I know very little. You know, what I understand is the history of financial fraud, and you're always making connections between, you know, and I'll never forget watching your interview with Norman Berglund. Is that how you pronounce his name? Berglund, yeah. Berglund, yeah. Excellent. Fascinating, yeah. fascinating interview. And he's describing the Voyager mission and when they started to get the photos back from the Voyager. And a chill went down my back because that's when the Iran-Contra financial fraud exploded. If you look at a lot of the fraud I was cleaning up at HUD, both as Assistant Secretary of Housing and then as the financial advisor, you know, suddenly you had this fraud explode through the 80s and it was so like somebody blew a whistle and said, we need trillions of dollars, go get any money any way you can. And I watched, went to Wall Street, had a very successful career as a member of the board and a uh, partner at Dillon Reed and Company, and uh, left there, we sold the firm, and then I left and went into the first Bush administration as Assistant Secretary of Housing and ran smack dab into all the mortgage fraud, which is related to the black budget. And I left and started an investment bank. I left the Bush administration thinking, you know, the fascists are gonna take this technology and kill us all. So I started an investment bank called the Hamilton Securities Group in Washington, and my interest was in figuring out how we could use new technology to help communities basically be financially successful without government money and sort of get the government out of our hair and decentralize, use technology to decentralize the financial system in a very healthy way. So, um, but once again, um, I, we ended up doing a project. We became lead financial advisor for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And, um, and I ended up in, uh, in a squabble with the federal government. We were making a software tool that would allow you to see all the government money in a community through G GIS software. And the reality carries the black budget finances one neighborhood at a time. <laughs> so transparent cash flows in every county make it much harder to, to do the black projects. And so smack, again, we ran into the mortgage fraud. And um, I ended up having uh, litigating with the federal government for 11 years. Ultimately, we were successful. And I settled the litigation. And in the process, what I discovered, I started to do radio shows. And the way part of the, one of the reasons I got into this topic was I, got on, I was on Coast to Coast. And I watched his explanation of their fears. And I thought, oh, I bet there's a connection. But my favorite moment on Project Camelot, I just have to tell you, was Bob Dean was speaking and he said, and it chill went back down my spine and I use this quote all the time, he said, he said, you know, we have to bring transparency to this because it is the destiny of the children in my family and the children I love to travel the stars. And I just said, woo, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that quote has inspired me for many years. So you got that beautiful. all on tape, thank you. That's a beautiful, yeah. beautiful story, yeah. yeah. Beautiful man as well. Yes, yeah. he is. Um, okay, so what I want to do here, and it's interesting you bring up Norm Bergram, because uh -huh. I have to say that that's one of our most uh, important interviews, yes. in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and we have a lot of very, very important, important interviews, interviews, so that's yeah. saying something. But this man is, uh, well, I forget his exact age, but he was, I think, over 85, I'm not sure exactly how old, uh, when we interviewed him. Right. And he has since disappeared. Okay. Really? So what happened is that he was living in a house very close to here in Los Altos Hills. Right. And he was living by himself. His wife had passed. And it was just a serendipity that we managed to get in the door and get the interview. And I mean, some, you know, the force was with us, so to right. speak. He had been being made an offer by a group that was going to take him. They were building him an underground, as he told us, 
an underground lab to start doing his you know whole work again. Right. So he was very excited. He was still writing a book. Right. I mean, he was just this very active 